I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people, dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night, and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil, or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things, and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. 
Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks, and then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry, maybe a cough or a sigh. I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night, 
because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned on the light, there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that. But it still freaks me out to this day. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say, peekaboo, when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the Big Bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, and indigenous, I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany 
to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late, and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit, and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue, more like a mini-festival vibe. So I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like, in German. She realizes that I am English, from my terrible German, and we start chatting in English. After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her, and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. It's quite a large open space, with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them, with something along the lines of, Hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about, where I'm from in England and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks per chance if he knows his uncle, and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore, and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit-chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody, and then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys, and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd, especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. 
Anyway, I've always dwelled on this, and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me, and it makes me question my version of events too. But I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot, and I've never hallucinated before. So, I honestly don't know how to explain it. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything, and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs, and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it? well enough to fool both my sister and I. To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows? In 2016, my girlfriend and I decided to go on our first vacation together. We booked a three-night stay at the Belmont Hotel, not its real name, which was a historic hotel in the old part of the city we were in. It was an elegant manor-style home from the 1850s, and parts of the property looked from that period. Massive staircases, a parlor room, and original furniture throughout. Our first day, we did the usual touristy stuff. Exhausted, we settled into our room and crashed for the evening. Our first night, we barely slept. My girlfriend and I were both uncomfortable sleeping in the room, and we felt like somebody was watching us. A few hours later, at about 3 a.m., we were abruptly awoken to a very loud sound coming from above our room. It sounded like somebody was pulling or pushing a large piece of furniture, that stuttering of wood on wood, and the creaking. It was unbearably loud. This went on ad nauseum for a while. We were totally awake, thinking that somebody was working upstairs, like a staff member moving furniture or rearranging the room. We were both dumbfounded, sitting upright in our beds waiting for this to end. The second day, more touristy stuff. We didn't really think much about the previous night. The second night, we were zonked out and ready to sleep early. This night was strangely similar. We woke up around the same time to the exact same creaking and stuttering of furniture, 
or something being moved around above us. It eventually stopped like the day before, and we managed to fall back asleep. The next thing I remember is my girlfriend waking me up abruptly, saying, What are you doing? I awoke, standing in the middle of the room in the dark, unpacking my bag angrily and throwing our clothes into the air. I snapped at her for asking me what I was doing and for interrupting me. I was frustrated and agitated upon waking. Suddenly, I vaguely remembered what I was doing, almost like a dream upon waking when you try to hang on to that dream. I sat on the bed and I explained that I was looking for a key in the room, and I remembered wandering around the room desperately, searching the walls, the floors, the furniture with my hands in the dark. I was getting more disturbed the more I explained this to my girlfriend. The idea that I was alone in this dark hotel room doing this really frightened me because I had no control. Needless to say, we decided to call it early and head home and end our vacation. We drove the full four hour drive home that night in pitch darkness and fog. I called the hotel that morning to check out early. Speaking with the front desk, I mentioned the loud noises coming from above our room. She replied, There is no room above yours. It's an attic space, and no staff would have been in there at that time. I mentioned that it sounded like somebody was dragging furniture on hardwood. She said that there was a lot of furniture up there, but that no staff member would have been there. I asked her if the hotel was haunted, and after a moment, she responded reluctantly that she's not sure, but she has heard other similar stories. I believe that I have seen gnomes on more than one account. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never entirely sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I have also never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived in his belated grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a drably dressed little old man about a foot and a half tall run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the absolute crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I've already been through, when he asked me what happened, I told him that I had just slipped. Another thing I once saw might have been a troll, but I'm unsure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you could enlighten me. I'd been doing a lot of meditating, about three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was a three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf troll type thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I have had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I've seen them, as well as one childhood encounter with my belated Noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing abnormal has ever been found, other than some white spots from chronic migraine, and those popped up super recently. I have even been evaluated by a neuropsychologist. No one has ever diagnosed me with anything other than seizures related to the head trauma, but, like I said, 
That happened after I started seeing these things. I'm not really sure what it is I'm seeing. I just thought it was interesting. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same co-worker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, Did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps. One saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, I primarily worked in two areas, the call center and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy, 
being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on, or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside, for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections, and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. My boyfriend and I had planned a camping trip in Canton, Oklahoma for October 27th through the 28th of 2018. We arrived at our campsite late in the afternoon and began our usual setup. Unloading the truck, pitching the tent, arranging the chairs around the fire pit, and stacking firewood. I was particularly excited for the evening fire because we had bought this massive log with a central hole soaked in a long burning solution. Once we'd tossed our cozy gear into the tent and set up our lights and speaker, we lounged around the fire pit. We chatted and listened to music as the sun descended. As night settled, my boyfriend lit the fire using the impressive log I had been so excited about. However, as darkness enveloped us, our speaker began emitting a strange, loud, glitchy static on several occasions, something it had never done before. We speculated that the spotty internet or the distance between the phone and speaker might be causing the issue. Despite our decent cell service, we couldn't discern the cause. The erratic static unnerved me, and although my boyfriend didn't voice it, I sensed it bothered him too. To distract ourselves, we decided to dig into our Fritos and bean dip and play with the glow sticks that we had brought. I recall a particularly vivid moment when, as we sat across from each other at the picnic table, my boyfriend crafted glasses from a pack of glow sticks, humorously placing the connector piece in his nostrils, mimicking oxygen tubes. We burst into laughter, but strangely, the next thing I remember is waking up inside the tent, snugly cocooned into a sleeping bag. My boyfriend was shivering, asking if we could share the bag. We exchanged bewildered glances, grappling with our sudden dislocation from the picnic table to the tent. Our mutual confusion only grew as we discussed our last memory, his playful act with the glow stick connector and our shared laughter. That unsettling feeling intensified when I couldn't find my jeans. Out of nowhere, a vivid memory flashed. I was at the picnic table, distressed, trying to remove large thorns from my jeans. My boyfriend was there trying to comfort and assist me. When I shared this with him, he initially brushed it off as a dream. However, my insistence and the discovery of the thorns on my shoelaces triggered his own recollection of the event. Stepping outside the tent, 
The scene was eerily familiar and untouched. A lone Frito in the bean dip, unbroken glow sticks, and the pack with the connector piece. The fire had burned through all of our wood, and the morning was unusually quiet. The manicured lawns around us made the presence of thorns on my shoes even more perplexing. One odd consolation, I guess, my boyfriend, a former 82nd Airborne Infantry paratrooper who usually woke up with daily pain, felt none that morning. Were we abducted? Were we fleeing from something? What caused our memory gap? While we both believe in extraterrestrial life, we're unsure if this experience can be attributed to that. This encounter has intensified my fear of the dark, and I have vowed to never tent camp again. To this day, neither of us have recovered any further memories from that night, and part of me wonders if it's better that way. For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then, another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, Hello? No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused we asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently, they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. This is important, because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us. Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. 
tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning, so I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey! Almost as if it was right next to me. It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kids stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. 
They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall, use both of my hands, and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done, and I would do the same at the top. But we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other, and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door, and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused, because mom should be making dinner right now, and dad would be getting home soon, or he already was. My other older sisters were never home, so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then, all of a sudden, our mom came to the door, and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls, but I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell, I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset, and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention, but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, 
like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50 pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair, despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plane stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me. It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy, that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier, I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it, had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores, but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore, without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small, and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior, and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way. Or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe, Unfortunately, we had our passport stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last-minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last-minute reservation online, and it was a pretty standard apartment-style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother, 
and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms, because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors, and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. I was too tired to push it, and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits, so I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in, and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared, and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room, where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. My heart was racing, and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room, and I didn't sleep for about two more hours until I could finally somewhat relax and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? Over the years, several friends and I have experienced an odd phenomenon while traveling around the state. We live in Michigan, by the way. On multiple occasions, we have inexplicably lost hours, and we've never been able to determine why. Sometimes I was alone, and other times a friend was with me. One of the most vivid instances, from approximately seven years ago, still unnerves me. Back then, I was living in Flint, Michigan, with my parents, about a year before relocating to Grand Haven. My friend and I decided to go camping in the Beulah, Frankfurt area, a journey that typically took between three to three and a half hours. We were no strangers to this route. We had made this trip numerous times over the years, especially since my family owned a lake house on Platt Lake, and we spent every summer there during my childhood. Wanting to maximize our time, we left Flint at three in the morning, hoping to get in some early morning fly fishing upon our arrival. Roughly two thirds of the way, on M115, just north of Cadillac, a peculiar calm enveloped the surroundings. Now, M115 runs through a national forest, so tranquility is the norm, but this calm was different. It was almost eerie. The early morning sun began to cast its first light, slowly illuminating the surroundings. 
Before we knew it, we were nearing the US-31 intersection in Benzonia. A glance at the car's clock showed 12 p.m., a detail my friend also observed. Doubting the car's clock, I checked my cell phone, which confirmed the time. Even a bank sign we passed displayed the same. The reality was hard to grasp. We had anticipated our arrival around 6 to 6.30 a.m., but here we were, six hours behind schedule. Fatigue wasn't to blame. I had had ample sleep the previous day, and with over 120,000 miles driven annually, I was accustomed to long hauls. Plus, both of us were well acquainted with the route. Our gas tank was still nearly full, indicating we hadn't just been driving aimlessly. Checking our credit card statements later, we found no gas charges during the missing hours. The truck's mileage aligned for the expected distance of our trip. What's most baffling is how seamless the time loss felt. We had no memory of any extended stops or detours. Our journey, by all accounts, felt typical in duration, but the clocks told a different story. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, and who had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. When I was a child, around eight years old, I think I had an encounter. I say think, because after another experience I had later in life, it was highly probable. I lived in Lake Orion, Michigan then. The bedroom I slept in was not on the second floor, but it was higher up than the average. When you entered my house, you had to walk up three stairs to be on the main floor. So the windows were not ground level, like ordinary homes and we also had a basement. The window next to my bed was the same height as the others. Ordinary people couldn't look into the window standing on the ground. I would like to guess that it was way over six feet off the ground. One night, I woke up facing the window. My bed was pushed up right against it. It was a reasonably small room. I opened my eyes, and my eyes were looking directly at an alien. 
Where we lived, there wasn't any light pollution, so it was very dark outside. But the way the moon was in the sky, it must have been full or close to it. It illuminated his head, which was entirely in view, and part of his neck. He had typical features of an alien, big black eyes, white grayish skin, and a small mouth. He had his hand resting on the window with long, thin fingers, three long and the fourth shorter. At the time, I didn't quite process his height because I was a child. I couldn't really rationalize then. But as I grew older, I realized it had to have been very tall. I remember being very scared. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would think I didn't see it. I rolled away from the window and lay very still. I always told myself it wasn't real. I've only told a couple of close friends about it because it always sounded silly. But as I got older, I wanted to share my story. Some background. I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in, and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably ten feet tall, and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too and it began to run toward us. I whipped the cart around and sped home. My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dog man, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. When I was seven, I woke up in the middle of the night to steal some biscuits from the kitchen. Our kitchen is right beside our conservatory which has a big open window that allows you to glance out into the garden. While eating, I heard some chatter from outside. Curious, I went to go peer outside the window. I saw three little men in red pointy hats outside in my garden, bickering amongst themselves in a strange language I've never heard of before or after. I was so stricken with terror that I didn't speak. I ran to my parents' bedroom to tell them about the intruders. My dad was reluctant to believe me, but he could see that I was obviously shaken up by something and came downstairs to investigate. They must have heard us coming, because by the time we'd gotten to the conservatory, they'd already pegged it and were running through the back gate. My dad got a glimpse of them too, but he only saw their red pointy hats. I've never seen him look so scared before or in such complete disbelief. I'm still completely baffled by the whole thing.
This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth, my birth, at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and a lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So as expected a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory, but before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but... My family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after rewatching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them walking, but also being careful to not be seen kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly, Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. 
My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched, noises, and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams, because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens, and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale 
and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends introduced me about ten years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high-pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite. But I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, 
one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance, and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and, stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor, and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. 
I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. My mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. So when I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. 
From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, supposedly, it had once been filled with ovens and a gas chamber. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserne that had outbuildings on base. They were, of course, off limits, but we snuck in some anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, the building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor. My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie and doors would fling open. We all had strange experiences. I would get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room. I would hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm telling this story, I'm getting creeped out. Anyway, one night around two or three in the morning, I got woken up by a nudge and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under my bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck? Are we having an alert? That's a random deployment readiness inspection that happens early in the morning. I thought maybe nobody told me. I threw on my uniform and opened the door, and it was completely dark. There wasn't a single light on and nobody was in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no idea what was going on. I went back to bed thinking I had completely lost my mind. I never told my friends because I thought I was losing it. I guess it can all be attributed to dreaming or sleepwalking or a half awake state. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, but honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. Thank you.